Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Lethal Sales. It's great to see everybody again this week. Our topic this week is why is it so painful for consumers to go to a car dealer and buy a car? Why does it seem like the dealers are in conflict against them? Who wants to go first? I'll take it. Okay, go for I'll it. I'll take it. And I'll, the reason why I'm taking it <laughs> is because this was the whole reason why I came back into the car business. It was such a bad experience purchasing a car after being in the business for 40 years that I, I said, we have to invoke change to this because we're, we're just, it, it was made me speechless and it still makes me speechless today to see how people are handled and treated in a car dealership. There are a number of people on this call that have platforms that take that pain away from the from the consumer and it's the consumer that is paying our 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 salaries and and we just don't seem to get that synergy that we can't live without them but we keep pushing them away by the way we're treating them so how can they ever be on the same page absolutely all we have to do is go out there and do the job properly with the right tools and with that i'm going to pass it on to my good friend larry and then i would like to i i'd like to pass that along the next statement to my good friend doug so let's larry tell us what you think about the the synergy between dealers and customers it's it's the classic breakdown between do what i say and not what i do um, and I think it's a flow through from upper management, sometimes even from ownership down through the ranks. You know, I, I've told this story before, forgive me for, for repeating myself, but I think it's central to this theme. When my first week on the job, the GM was leaving the store and the operator said, you have a call boss. And he said, tell him I left. So the message to anybody with an earshot was to hell with the customer. If they have a problem, let them wait. If they want to buy three cars, who needs that? Well, we're not here to sell cars. If your treatment doesn't make sense, if you're not into putting your arm around people and, and trying to be empathetic, what do you expect to have happen? And, and I got to tell you, um, a lot of my really, really good friends are in the car business or are related to the car business. Um, and I'm not being, you know, overboard here. Uh, I've had a chance to meet the the people on this show in various places, uh, I met I met Kaylee, uh, it, it, I believe it was either Vegas or Dallas the first time, and Jeff Shearer I was lucky enough to meet in Vegas. Um, I've just, you're, you're all really good friends of mine, and, and I'm still friendly with a lot of dealers and GM, I mean, friends, friends, not a, acquaintances, but boy, there are a lot of strange people in the car business. Who, whose philosophy is more short-sighted than the, the most short-sighted salesperson. And they don't think long-term, and it's probably the reason that fixed stops always gets a backseat, because they can't see the forest for the trees. So I, I, I just think that what they say, you know, hey, we're family-oriented. Yeah, maybe if it's the Mob Barker family, because they don't seem to understand the concept of make everything fun and easy and make people feel a part of a family of where they're actually appreciated. So I, I, I and, and I got to tell you, not only don't I think it's changing for the better with all the lack of communication I see among people, it, it, it's, it's worse than ever. Um, so, yeah. I'm so sorry. in saying that Larry, you, and it's going to play right into what Doug and I talk about all the time. First, we got to build the dealership experience. And then, and then that dealership experience that we've we've ingrained into our teams that we are one. We are all about servant, certain servant leadership and and everything else. And and then then we pass that on to the customer experience because then we're truly entrained into how our customers want to be. And would you not agree with that, Doug? 
No, I would totally agree with that. It all starts with the employees. Hey, hey Doug, I, oh. I was training today in Florida and I was up to, uh, before I gave him a break for lunch, I got up to my Sam uh, Walton quote, which is the customer is the boss. Because if the customer stops buying, they can fire anybody and they can close the company down. Um, and the evidence is if you went into a Walmart while he was alive, everything was perfect. And now that he's passed on and his kids are splitting up billions, every Walmart's in disarray. So once again, if your focus isn't clear, if you have a dog and you point, your dog never looks where you're pointing, he looks at your finger. And when we forget why we're there, which is to serve the customer, to make the customer happy, um, and to even remember that we'll extract more money from customers if they're happy and if they're repeat referral. Mm -hmm. Good points. <clears throat> I would say a couple of things, Peter and Larry and everybody else. <clears throat> Regarding the customer, you know, what's painful to me is that in spite of everything that's going on, customers keep coming in. It's only when customers quit doing it that dealers will get to get the idea of, wait, maybe we're doing something wrong. And we've seen it with dealerships that are doing it right. They're taking customers from people that aren't. But the thing that's truly interesting to me is how a dealer treats his best friend when he comes in to buy a car versus anybody else. Because if you think about it, most of the time when the dealer's buddy comes in, he's whisked through quickly. You know, here's your car. I gave you a great deal. Um, we'll blow right through finance. You'll be out of here in no time. And they'll treat those people the same way. And those people aren't going to make them as much money as the average customer, but the average customer doesn't get treated the same way. And that's to me is a, is a strange juxtaposition. Doug, you're hundred percent right because the focus isn't on, listen, I, I, I say it all the time that we, we should treat, we should understand that, the managers, even the owners, their name may be on the check, but they don't pay you. Your customers pay you. And as soon as we lose sight of that balance, we're done. Hey, before we go to, to Kaylee and April, two of my favorite ladies, my buddy Ian Nethercott is on. Is it okay if we hear from Ian? Because I got to tell you, if we're talking about nice and supportive and loyal, I don't know that I'd put too many people ahead of Ian. Um, I'm I'm always on Ian's show. Uh, and... It is he is relentless with trying to get me leads in business. Um, and it, with him, it never feels like it's an imposition. It's just what he does and how he does. So, Ian, we're talking about why does it have to be so torturous between what a dealer says and what the actual buying experience is? And, and anybody that doesn't know, besides running just about as good a podcast as anybody's ever seen with the Auto Hub show every uh, Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard, his family's always been in the dealership business, and he himself has worked in multiple dealerships. Hey, it looks like Steve Apicell is here. Steve, we'd love to hear from you right after Ian, please. Ian, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I was training a dealer um, in Arizona today. We were training some salespeople on vid calls, and we were asking the salespeople, how was business? And he's like, well, it's slow. And it's like, well, it's slow because what are you doing? You're waiting. You're, you're not talking to people. You're, you know, it's so a lot, a lot of it is a lot of it is maybe the dealer saying, Hey, you know, like maybe you don't have to do it my way, or maybe you don't have to do it the way I say, but it's also the salespeople waiting for the up bus. I mean, we were at NADA and there was actually a, a company there with an up bus, but at the end of the day, I mean, Peter says this all the time. Why aren't you calling your customers that bought from you over the last year or three months and say, Hey, no, like, no, no. you know, hey, looking for a car. You know, I love you, but I have to interrupt you. You're completely wrong. <laughs> well, your philosophy is wrong. If salespeople okay. prospect and follow up, they'll get repeat and referral business and they'll probably double their income and that'll put them in a tougher tax bracket. So they'd much rather be yeah, unsuccessful be morons who stare out the window and complain there's no business. Why would yeah. anybody in their right mind rather have a guy with an ad in his hand that's going to five <laughs> dealers as opposed to the guy that cuts his hair, a guy who he went to school with, a friend. You you couldn't be any writer, my friend. Yeah, he said, he said, I said, hey, business is slow. I said, yeah, but it's good it's not February anymore, right? He says, oh, yeah, absolutely. February was worse. <laughs> Beautiful. Hey, before, before we jump to April and Kaylee, we've got a rare visit from my good and great friend, Steve Apicella. 
Steve, we're, we're talking about the, the wide gap between how dealerships present what the buying experience is and then the twilight zone you walk into when you actually get there. You know, I, when, I would, when I saw this title, I wanted to contribute something because, um, you know, I love, like everybody on here, I love this great industry. I really do. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm not the guy that thinks everything's wrong. There's a lot that's going right, but there's definitely some stuff that's not desirable. And the the contribution I wanted to make was in the past week, I've gone through two car buying purchases. And whenever I do this, I do it not with the 4,000 dealers that we work with, but dealer I don't know. And I don't tell them I'm in the auto industry because I just want to, I want to get the experience and I want to, I want to speak credibly about it. But the other thing, like many people, I don't have a lot of time to waste. Um, so each of these deals, I went, found a local dealer here in Colorado. Uh, both are very reputable, large dealers. Um, found a vehicle, basically negotiated it before I showed up. Um, and deal number one, when I got there, um, it was a clown show. I mean, it just, it was not a great experience. And, and I ended up being there. I pre-negotiated and picked the car and I'm in the industry. And I was there for four and a half hours. Wait a minute, Steve. Aren't you saying that at the risk of effect, uh, uh, offending clowns? Because when you leave the clown show, you're usually smiling and happy. Yeah, right. It was just, you know, it was a, it was a comedy of errors, basically. And it just took pre-negotiating being in the industry, not telling them I'm in the industry four and a half hours is way, way too long. Mm. I was exhausted by the experience. Mm. Um, the second one, which was the most recent one I had arranged. I was flying home on a Friday, arranged to go there Friday afternoon, same deal, chose the car. Um, this was for a family member, pre-negotiated it, showed up, and they couldn't find the car. I was there for over an hour and I said, I'm, I'm not going to fight traffic on the way home. And I just, I've had a long week. I find the car, let me know. And then I'll see if I'll come back. So I left and uh, they shot me a text a couple hours later saying, Hey, we found the car. Um, you know, we'd love for you to come back. So the next day I, I, I just showed up unannounced. I had already, again, pre-negotiated it. The car was there. And at every single corner, um, the deal changed. <laughs> and, you know, and I know, again, I, I'm in this industry and dealers need to make money and, and I get it. But um, I was there for five hours this time, mm. which is which is not great. And at the end of it, after the these comedy of errors, the deal ended up being the deal I negotiated before I got there. So it took us five hours to get back there. And then the final insult was they couldn't find the second set of keys. And the problem with that is they're going to order a set of keys, but they want me to come back an hour and a half away and get them programmed. And, and I, my interest level on that is just about zero. Steve, can, and, I, can, I, can I throw one more thing at it? And yeah. it's so nice to see you, my friend. Yeah, good to it's, see you too. Let me tell you the scariest thing about what you just told me. Um, everybody that knows me will concede that I'm a little mentally unstable. I, I enjoy it and it makes my life fun, but I'm careful. I'm 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 never never gamble. I don't drink, smoke, do drugs. I've only been married once. Same band for thirty years. I'm I'm cautious. I'm a cautious lunatic, and one of the things I do is I appear to be reckless, and then at night I think was I too reckless. That I because I I trained today for three hours and fifteen minutes and I had to throw the people out for lunch. That's how entertained they were. Right. The scary part is not that it was four hours or five hours. It's that these idiots will do the same thing tomorrow and next month. When you left, nobody said, "Wait a minute, it was five hours." Now let's let, real quick and I'll move on. Let's yeah. count how many things are wrong with that. First of all, you were coming in ready to buy. There was no gain, which we all hate. Right? I'm going to. And they, they made you wait five hours. The other thing is, I'm probably bad with math, but if they sold you in two and a half hours, that means they could have sold two customers in that time frame. If it was an hour, five. 
So they hurt their own staff. They hurt the salesperson. They pissed you off be to the point where you, you said, I'm never on Larry's show. I'm coming on tonight to let him know that the morons that are out there. But Again, what you, know, I, I, you see, you see a smile on my face. You know, I, I I'm glad I went through it in the sense that it, it reminds me of the reality of it is a great industry, but there's a lot of things that we have to do to refine it. And, you know, the, some of the errors that occurred, if anybody's interested, is at one point they're like, oh, you know what? Sorry, we got you on the wrong VIN. We got to redo the deal. It was just kind of, you know, we're on the wrong car. Um, but from a from a guy who's in the industry, four and a half or five hours is I, I don't have that much time to burn. And I don't have one second's pity for the wrong VIN. I averaged 31 and a half cars a month for 11 years before I became a partner. I never made a, a mistake. Now, now, I'm not bragging that I'm good. I'm bragging that I was scared to death to screw up because yeah. I saw a couple of these idiots where I worked have to bring a customer back, waste the whole day. Not only were the customer unhappy, the women in the back were unhappy and they're the same ones that got you paid. Scary. You know, the other thing which which was a challenge for me because the part of the industry that I, I spent a lot of time with, which is F and I, four and a half hours for one car, five hours for the other, I barely got an F and I presentation. Oh well they were then no, no no. Once again, you you're not looking at it from the right perspective. They had to concentrate on making you nauseous, wasting your day, so they certainly didn't have any time to make profit. I, I again I, I listen it. It's one of my favorite quotes from my all-time idol, Ben Franklin. We are all born ignorant, but one must work hard to remain stupid. And that's what this dealership did. I, I, guys, I don't know about you. I'm always in a hurry. Five hours, four hours for a guy. And, and anybody that doesn't know Steve Apicella, it's the nicest, easiest guy you'll ever meet. He, he doesn't have one ounce of jerk in him. So if they're doing that to him for four or five hours, what are they doing to everybody else? And I guarantee if one of, uh, if anybody, if he was, he doesn't, he won't disclose it. He's a gentleman, but if he disclosed the name and we went through the same drill, the same thing would happen to us. Steve, thank you so much. Um, and uh, it, I'm very sorry you suffered through that, but as always, it's great to see you. Yeah, good hey, to it, see everybody. Yep. It's a, come in whenever you want, man. Come in uh, whenever you Larry, want. Larry. Yes. Larry, just before we, we move on, uh, I know Tony. Tony has a seven thirty uh, for his church group. So come on, Tony, you go first, we and then we'll hear from our, our then we'll hear from our brilliant ladies. Go ahead, my buddy. You got to hit the mute button, Tony. It's that technology thing. Would you like me to interpret, Tony? You keep yeah, talking, yeah, you're on mute. And I'll, hey, and I'll hey Tony, I got your back. I read lips. I'm not sure what you're I saying, Tony, to but you look the, very uh, animated. Are we, do we got him yet? No, he's dead. No. He, so, hey, Tony, we love you. Good luck with, with, the, with your group. Um, and next week when we get you on, we'll, we'll have you speak first. Oh, wait, wait. he's on. Go ahead, oh, my brother, yeah. quick. I'll tell you this mobile app for Zoom. I just can't get it to work when I want it to work. Hey, thanks, Larry. I'm going to jump, as you said. But guys, tomorrow, uh, Friday morning, uh, 7 Central, the APA will be on. It's mm -hmm. our We're going back to our old time, uh, 7 Central, 8 Eastern. So we'll be on for 45 minutes before David Long's room. Uh, invite you guys to come and invite, invite, invite. We've gotten some really positive response to the time change, including David Long, who has endorsed us and supported us. So we're excited about that. Sorry, I can't stay on for much longer. I love this conversation. At the end of the day, we auto dealers have to stop being control freaks. That's the bottom line. We're control freaks. We feel like a customer comes in, we need to take control. Listen, here's what you need to do. You need to do this and you need to open it up, drop the control and move the deal. And it's just so much easier, guys. Why do we make it so hard? Love hey, you guys. Tone, how, how long is your church group? When does it run till? <clears throat> uh, 8.30, quarter to five. So All right, if you want to come back on after the show, we're going to take a screwdriver, warm it up and put it in Steve Apicella's eye. Because if he went to the second dealer after the first this man enjoys pain. 
<laughs> he likes pain. <laughs> Steve, I'm sorry for your pain, man. I really am. It's a, I know you're a great guy, and I know you love the business. The best. But man, we got to anesthetize our customers against this pain that we're putting them through. Love you guys. Got to go. Good night. All right. See you, Tony. Uh, Kaylee or, or April, um, we would love to hear from you, too. And thank you, the, both of you, for, for showing up so much. I'll let April go first because I'm gonna. The baby's making a lot of noise right now, but I do have something to say. Well, we, we you can put the baby on. Anything that drowns me out will probably make everybody else on the call very happy. <laughs> it's just hard to talk when he's yelling. So. All right, April, oh, that's you're up. Too funny. Well, I gotta, I I gotta tell you, I am absolutely exhausted, but but my cup is full. Um, Kaylee and I both had an opportunity to go to one of my most favorite conferences this week at Business Bourbon and Cigars. So I just got home about two hours ago, um, and you know, obviously this this these conversations are are out there, and a lot of people are talking and. You know, like I always, I, I do say this a lot, and I said this on, on the woman's conversation, things are changing. Are they changing as quick as people would like? No. Um, the fact that that, that happened, or, you know, five-hour example to happen twice for Steve, that's just yep, awful. It's, crazy. Yep. it's just awful. Um, and to have that many mistakes and issues like that, that's, that's just, it's crazy to me that that's that bad. But I also know that I could go to any one of my stores and on any given Tuesday, I could have a wonderful experience. And on that same Tuesday next week, have the worst experience of my life. And I genuinely believe that a lot of times it boils down to the salesperson that you're dealing with, that direct human and their ability to communicate and be the translator between the customer and the sales manager. And too many times sales managers nowadays just won't get off their butt and go talk to customers. And if they would, a lot of that would be would be solved. But that's um, April, because... that you're you're a hundred percent right. But a lot of that boils down to the lack of training. And I'm not even talking about me coming in. I'm talking about role playing, going over things. Cause if if you don't do whatever you're doing, if you don't do it frequently, yep. it gets stale. Yep. Yep. We, and, and, but here's the thing, Larry, and this is where this really comes from. We have, you know, this is an epidemic in car dealerships always has been. Um, we are not proactive people. We are reactive people and where that reactiveness starts and starts this problem that, that just kind of seems to always spiral is in the hiring process and the onboarding. When we hire, I mean, we hire a human, how many times do do they go a week and they don't even have logins to start training or or these sort of things? And the training that they don't get is because, and I watch it, I watch it with the sales managers. They get so tired of, of training all the time because, and then they, they don't understand that the lack of not training is the reason that the people keep leaving and, and then they have to start over and that's the whole, it's the chicken or the egg. It's a April, can I, can I, you can, can I solve some... all our problems if we would just take the time to hire properly, only, only hire for upgrades and not hire to replace, you know, not hire yep. for, for desperation. And I think we would solve so many of these problems if we were really, really focused on, on staff quality versus quantity. And so much of this would be resolved um, over time, if we made that a, a focus out of the gate. Sorry, go ahead, Larry. It, well, you'll love this, April. I have my format, like everything else in my crazy life, is backwards. I interview people. When I do a, a recruiting training thing, I interview for two days, and then I train for two days. And I'm not making this up. It's so funny you said that. I'm at Ghetto Hyundai in Lakewood Ranch, and I'm training at Ghetto Toyota because they're putting up a new building. And I go in and the GM hugs me and he says, I want you to say hi to somebody. Sure. Who is it? It's a guy I had in class years ago who became so successful. He's now one of the big managers. And he said what April just said. He said, but sideways, he said, you know, I got to tell you, he said to the GM, when I met Mr. Feldman, I thought he was crazy because I actually said to him, why the heck am I going to training if I don't have a guarantee of a job? I said, because, hey, I want to determine who's got what it takes. 
And if I get you hired, I want you to hit the ground running. And he mm -hmm. says, I thought you were nuts, which I probably am, but it worked. I'm with you 100 percent, April. I, I got I got to tell you the truth. I, I, I wish I was out of the recruiting business. And all I had to do was go in and fine tune people. But right. because they don't prepare them properly, because they put them in a state of confusion and everybody passes the buck, they're making it difficult. Yep. Yep. A hundred percent. Because, because there are times where we have really good experience. I mean, I just had an experience and this happened. Um, it kind of the, the end of it happened today, so to speak, but you know, it, it, this just goes to show how, like, I don't know, I think sometimes we're scared or something. I'm not really sure, but I had a bad situation happen. Um, about three weeks ago, I had one of my managers and, and, you know, I won't name names or anything like that, but I had one of my managers, call a customer, you know, typical follow up, left a voicemail, all things are well, hangs up the phone, but didn't hang up the phone. Oh, but this is going to be good. <laughs> what happened for over the next three minutes of the conversation that this customer overheard was the boys locker room awfulness that you would all, you mm -hmm. know, no, yep. no one in yep. this, no one on this call would be shocked that that was happening. Right. So Everyone now is just like basically scared of this customer because he sent in the general manager won't call him won't call and talk to him the the um one of the desk managers his idea of following up with this customer was hey Mr. customer uh, I just wanted to call and let you know that we took care of the situation okay okay um can we help with anything all right have a nice day they they locked him out they said okay we're not going to follow up with this customer, right? Just put them on the do not call, do not email list, da da da. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why? Why are we causing this problem that that making it worse? We're making it worse. I said, you know what? I'm going to call the customer. So I called the customer, talked to the customer, apologized, heard him, let him explain to me what the worst parts of it were. You know, the guy is not you know, an a-hole or anything of that nature. And at the end of the day, I said, hey, I'm more than happy to still help you purchase a vehicle. I understand if you don't want to, I would completely get it. Um, but I'm happy to be your point of contact going forward. He called me back. He said, okay, well, my wife is a little uncomfortable with coming to the dealership just based on hearing all this. And I said, I, I completely get that. How about I have Barb? She's one of my most best, best salespeople. I'll have her be your only human. I'll have her bring the car out to you. I'll have her bring all the paperwork out to you. Um, and can we get this deal put together? And I'm happy to help. And he said, that would be great. Well, then um, my store had just signed up this, this uh, 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 beta thing where they're using chat on the OEM site, right? And doing the DR of digital retailing through the OEM site. And the trade appraisal number that this guy got was out of control. Like I was like, there's no effing way that this is right. So now I'm like thinking, oh, great. Here we go again. I got to go now tell this guy, like, you can't buy this car for, or trade your car in for this number because it's way out of whack, right? He's completely understanding, completely understanding. I said, you know, this, the system told you this, here's all, all these other ones. He goes, and so then he came back to me and said, you know what? You're right. I went on to all those sites that you showed me and I couldn't get the number that, that this gave me. No problem. Comes right back at me and says, April, in all honesty, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. The payment, the down payment, right? Gave me the numbers. I worked the deal out to make it happen for him and everything was done. He's happy, happy, happy. Um, and, and we have a car deal, right? So and instead, I had a GSM tell me, well, why are we selling this guy a car? It's just going to be a bad survey. There's there's such this bad mentality about all these things, right? Where I'm like, look, possibly, but I don't think so. You know, I, it's just any time we have a bad experience is because we create objections that weren't even there. We create scenarios that weren't even there. and And that's where sales is just it's it's got to it's just simpler it's simpler we overcomplicate it we just got to hear people put it together listen to them talk to them like real people that's it it's just really not that hard um but one of the things that uh you know at the start of this conversation that i also found really interesting is you know this idea that we've got to go back to teaching our people how to fish and and getting them to understand the who moved my cheese of of like stop with the woe is me and 
feed me, feed me, feed me and say, hey, let, rather than me just feeding you, which is what we've done the last three years, now that you're gluttonous and you don't understand, we need to go back and teach people how to fish. And, and, and more importantly, we have to teach them why it's better for them to want to fish versus just have the fish put on their plate. And that's a harder, that's the harder aspect. It's actually the harder part of it is changing the mindset of the people working at the dealership to want to fish um, that I find to be the harder part. But when it hey, happens, hey, hey, you get great people. April, four things. First, um, at some point, maybe even before or after Kaylee, I saw my buddy Ian raise his hand a couple times to make a comment. So we'll let him talk. Two, now you all see why I love April Simmons. She steps into every breach. She's always the same cheerful, positive person. Third, I always quote Ben Franklin. He's my hero. He said, never ruin an apology with an excuse. She didn't give an excuse. She just flat out was empathetic. And last but not least, I want to commend you and your group with that GSM. It's beautiful for people like you to hire somebody with a brainstem injury who obviously has a non-functioning <laughs> cerebrum and cerebellum. So God bless you. All right. Okay. Just okay. like before he jumps on, I just want to say something. Yeah. Okay. So Try to keep a straight face, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> As a person with a brain injury, I laugh my head off at that. So, um the very first thing that april said a customer is only a customer when they're heard we got to get that through our heads yeah. that's when a customer becomes a customer um second thing that april said was that we we live in fear in a, in a dealership we have a an eight fear of what if they don't the people that we've hired don't show up why are we spending money on this why are we doing this why are we why are we engaging our it people to set them up we don't know if they'll be here in a week because we don't know who they are well whose fault is that that's our fault as the stakeholders and managers of hiring those people if we don't have the confidence in who we're hiring then that is our fault and the last thing i'm going to say about this is the problem, and I've said it a thousand times, we operate the car business on a 30-day turn. And that's, we, we focus on that, and that's all we care about. And it's said so many times, we're only as good as our last month. And I can't stand it. And that's one of the biggest problems. So hey, go two things. I noticed a quote from Steve Apicella, who's also quoting Ben Franklin. And you left out one of April's comments uh, about how handsome I look in my yellow shirt. Oh, no, I apologize. That was a text she sent me. I'm sorry. And I feel the same way about you, April. All right. Uh, Kaylee or Ian, whoever would like to speak up now that I've made everybody insane. Well, there's two there's two thoughts. Number one, uh, get your general manager a book. Actually, I'll buy you the book, April. I'll send it to you to send me an address. It's called The, uh, it's called the Obstacle is the Way, and it's based on Stoic teachings. And it's yep. a great book to turn every obstacle into an opportunity. The other one that's a great book for anyone who works with people of any type is called Surrounded by Idiots. It's the gentleman who came up with the disc profile. And it will work in any type uh, of situation in your life because it, it, it talks about situations and how do you handle not only people but personalities. It'll help you in your relationships, in management. It'll help you in seeing people in a different way. But also, don't be afraid to say your story. Things happen. And it's, it, if you're afraid of that customer, that's never going to go well. Whether no. it's a chat bot or whether it's a person or whether it's a, a PR thing or whether it's a lawyer, it doesn't matter. You, you got you got to apologize and say, hey, that could have went better. Obviously, we learned from it. But more importantly, how can we help you? Would you because right, at could the end you of the day, without the customer, chance to make you yeah, happy? Right. Yeah. If, without the customer, there ain't there isn't a business. So right. uh, I'll send you a couple of books, April. You just let me know. And just so you know, we trained a couple of your staff at your board store today. And they were a real quick study. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident they'll do well. Good, good. And, I, and I'll, I'll be back in the office tomorrow and be able to wrap up the rest of the other stuff. But um, I do want to say, so Surrounded by Idiots, I actually finished that book um, in October-ish. And I gave it to yep, the board and, and I it. said, hey... I need, excellent, excellent. I said, I need y'all to make this one of the GM required reading books because they oh, do, absolutely. every month they pick a book uh, in the GM uh, meeting for them to, you know, to read or rec it's at least a recommendation, right? Like 
unfortunately, yeah. like not everybody reads or will read, but it was one of my most favorite books. And it's funny because I will tell you that like, even as I was in the book, I'm like, and that's that GM and that's that GM yep. and that one's yep. this one. Like you just recognize, you just, you literally can start to meet people. And immediately yep. I started assigning colors to them. I'm like, and you are this and you are that. <laughs> April, could you, could you get somebody in the dealership to read it to that unnamed GSM? Cause obviously his, uh, his, you know, understanding skills are a little lacking. Yeah, no, um, that that one uh, that one is tough because you know there's there's an issue you know, and this is part part of the problem I think too is we you know, and I'll try to be short because I know I'm I'm going long winded a little bit today, but we have this problem like you know alcoholics who have children who become alcoholics, or we have you know people who were you know brought up in abusive homes become abusers, and these things happen because that's how we learn. And unfortunately, the majority of our managers in automotive space were not taught properly, and now they're teaching not properly. And so their habits and their things are just not great because of it. Um, but you're starting to see some shift. You're starting to see, you know, a lot of people really starting to pour into leadership and understanding that those things are important. So, you know, I think I think the the good apples are finally starting to win over the bad apples, and in some cases, I think we just got to wait them out. I hate to say it, but it's not that we can have to wait them out. Beautiful. Hey, Kaylee, are you free to speak now? Yeah, yeah, I can Please. speak. Well, I've got um, talking about all of this. I guess um, I've got two car buying experiences, um, and one of them validates that it is changing because I wanted a specific color and style of Bronco. So I didn't do it. I tasked my husband to do it because I didn't have, have the time um, to research and find it for me. <laughs> and so we found it all the way in Oregon and they delivered it and all the paperwork was done. Um, and it was the quickest experience I ever had buying a vehicle. Um, so I think my point of sharing that is it is changing, um, but it also, you know, goes back to, you know, I bought that car from a dealership in Oregon where I'm not going to service that vehicle there. Um, so there's that gap in, you know, if you're selling cars online like that. Um, and then my other car buying experience um, was local and it was, it was longer, but they were pretty quick um and i think the reason why i'm sharing that is um i think the service part of it is you know um getting it serviced i did not purchase a service contract it wasn't presented to me um it is it was a used vehicle um or is a used vehicle uh but i think one thing that i've noticed is when i've gotten it serviced at this dealership is they have a really good process of showing me what they did what's coming, showing me pictures, but I would like to like, I don't know if you guys all know of some sort of service out there, but it would be nice to have like these records so I could go back to see, oh, this, this is what I have to plan for. You know, this is all this, the, the yellow that I denied or that I need to prepare for and all that good stuff. So um, kind of a different perspective of what you guys are all talking about, but that's just kind of what I wanted to share. Kaylee, if we don't get it right and fix stops, the rest of it doesn't matter because we lose the customer, we lose the next sale, and we leave, lose all the gross we develop as well as the loyalty and the base, which no dealership can long-term survive with. April, do you have your hand up again? No, oh, that's the clappy emoji. Oh, okay. That's a clappy I, listen, emoji. What, listen, what do you want from me? I have a sundial and an abacus in my trunk, and my iPhone has a rotary dial. Please. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, Larry, can I make one other observation? And it's a little bit old school. And even though I'm a digital transformation contributor, one of the things that happened on both, I had all this time at the dealer. So I'm almost making small talk, asking questions about the car. And both salespeople had no idea about the attributes of the car. And one of the things, because I asked and I, I hadn't thought about it before, I'm like, well, do you, do you have like a brochure for the vehicle? Or apparently that went away a long time ago. 
Yeah, it's all digital. It's all on the websites these days. Yeah, and I and they were just going to Google to see if they can answer my questions. And it's an interesting thought, even though it's analog. The brochure educated the customers, but it also educated the salespeople about you know what were the attributes of this vehicle. Like I'm the guy that I ask the question. It's not what the car has on it; it's what it doesn't have. I don't want to show up at home an hour later and figure out I missed a benefit of the car. I missed an option that I would have otherwise liked, but the, the product knowledge was not terrific. And either but Steven, isn't, isn't it incumbent upon the salespeople to learn their damn product? You know, one, one of the, point, yeah, this things, point, yeah, yeah. That one of the interesting things about this business, and I explained it again today, I got a 12 guys I'm trying to get hired is you have a lot of free time on this job and how you use it is strictly your choice. If you want to moan and bitch, you'll waste your whole day. But if you spend some time thinking about feature advantage benefits on your your vehicle opposed to others, because we never badmouth anybody, we just point out differences. If you do some role playing and if you spend some time, A, the day flies by, you're not bored. And B, when, when the people show up, you're ready. Listen, I, I'm a boxing nut. And I can tell you, I've seen a lot of great boxers get knocked out because they came into the ring without sweating. The other guy was warmed up, caught him with a right hand, and they were down. We got to be ready when the bell rings. And this comes down. Uh, 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 forgive me for getting off track. My ADHD is popping in. I showed Joe DiMaggio slide, and I explained to a couple of the baseball fans that they wanted to be this guy when they grew up. He was making 100000 when the average American made 45 hours a week, and he married Marilyn Monroe. Right. And they asked him, why did he play so hard? Fred, when DiMaggio played, it was all day games and he wore a wool uniform. Can you imagine standing in the Bronx or Boston when it's 102 degrees? And he said, the little boy in the stands may only see me play once. If this is the game, I want to be at my best. We need to instill that kind of pride in our salespeople. Virtue has to be its own reward, Steve, because as far as I know, they stopped giving out trophies for it. If they yeah, don't I think, take you know, I, it, I think every customer is different, of course, but I'm one of those customers that if I'm more educated about it, I'm likely to upsell myself. No, um, no, no. I, You're just like everybody else. The more we know and the more comfortable we feel, the better. Yeah. No, listen, listen. You're. I'm not kidding now. This this Steve Apicella is one really sharp dude. I mean, smart as hell. I would like to believe I'm kind of smart, but both of us, when we were in high school. If we didn't know the answer, it was like our hands were glued to our lap. On the other hand, when we knew the answer, yeah, I know that one. Nobody likes to feel stupid. And if the customer is informed by the dealer and the salesperson, he might say, you know, that's a pretty cool thing. Can I get that? Is it available? So I don't think you're, you're, you're brighter than a lot of people, but I think you're the same in the sense that the more comfortable we feel, the more we know, the better we are. No doubt. Well, and I, I will go to, to the point where Steve was talking about that, that the people are just not providing themselves the, the best practices of, of learning about the product that they represent anymore. They're sitting there going, because they've la lasted through the last three years of the heyday, and they never needed to talk about the car. It's there. Do you want it? It's there. If you don't, that person will take it. And that's what they were, that's what was going on for the last three years. Now, what we have is a, a giant challenge where people now have to come back and say, hold on, what's that car having in again? How how do we have to do it? Now that requires effort. Now, in in our in our not search for knowledge in this industry, we know that the average salesperson at a dealership works 2.6 hours a day. That's it, out of an eight hour shift, 2.6 hours. They have all the time in the world to do something, but that requires time and effort. But th what they're not seeing is that, that time and effort will get rewarded because they will become better at their craft. They'll become better at talking to the customers and they'll be better at conversions. Conversions equal reward. And this is the challenge that we're we're facing because the people are saying, well, I, I didn't have to do that to make $150,000 last year. Why do I have to do it now? They're always looking at the upward trajectory. They're not looking at maintenance. 
And that's where the first priority data is so important in a, in a car dealership to remain on the structured growth tool. Hey, Peter, that was brilliant. Before we get to uh, my man, Mike Larkin and, and Fred and Wendy, I got a text from Steve Apicella, a technical question. Steve, you shut your computer off by hitting the on button. Call me with anything you need, my buddy. It's, it's, it's scary <laughs> how much these nerds depend on me. Okay, uh, Michael Larkin, still dressed like an elf from St. Patrick's Day. Speak up, my good and great friend. Hey, you know what? I, I'm I'm going to defer my time once again to the birthday girl this week. Wendy, take it away. Thank you. That's very gracious of you, but I don't... Can you please repeat the question? The short version? <laughs> Wendy, do you think I remember the damn question? I'm not even sure what I'm showing on anymore. Well, I tell you, I already know it's relevant to what my week is right now if it's talking about outreach and not working no 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 no. let me let me give it to you because you you know you're my favorite what we're talking about is how crazy is it uh, that the dealers all talk about a great process and how much we have to take care of the customer until the customer shows up and then it's living hell i don't know if you're on earlier steve apicella one of the easiest smartest guys to get along with set up two car deals he set them up he arranged the no big deal four hours and five hours. They lost the car. They lost the keys. They jerked him around on price. Nuts. So we're, we're just trying to figure out little ideas or big ideas as to why the hell these people project one image. And then when you get there, it's completely sideways and possibly what we can do better. The floor is yours, good lady. And you're asking a BDC person that question? Holy Toledo. Yeah, but I oh, oh, I love my BDC. When I when I had my store, I'll never forget the first time a salesman came to me complaining. My door was always open. I said, "What is it? This damn BDC keeps bringing customers in." <laughs> and your complaint is what? Perfect segue to what I want to share. So it's very very interesting. I get a lot of Godwings in my life. Like like you know like our agents, we're onboarding like 30 new agents right now because we've been extremely blessed the last couple of weeks and we have a couple of new products and whatever. But, um, you know, there was a time and I knew you guys know me. I'm like, don't worry, don't, don't worry. It's going to happen. Well, it's happening. And the floodgates are open. So that said, I'm also getting a lot more with, again, the human side of AI. We're getting, we're coming full circle since August. And wasn't that a great call this morning, Mike? It was, we are now what we envision, those of us that have vision, that already knew it, that were like, okay, AI is cool. Let's check out the products. Let's tell you how to evaluate them, blah, blah. Dealers want to buy them. They're buying more shiny things for the customers. We're like, yeah, but you got to remember the human side and what the human side is evolving into. Great call. You missed it, Peter. It was awesome. The great, because it's what you guys are talking about right here. It's that it's the same as when you start a BDC, and they're complaining, oh, they're going to take my customers. I'm not going to have any customers on the sales or the service end with the advisors. Then you start pushing traffic and they're like, holy crap, I can't handle all these customers. So they got to juggle two and three on the floor on the sales end. And then they learn to actually work to close the deals. Or we're going to hire more staff and you'll have less opportunity, your choice. And then there's the service advisors that are running around. The phones are ringing. They're not answering. So what we're, what's coming now is it's coming full circle and AI is slowing down. Why? Because what we predicted back in August, they don't have their houses in order before they're adding. Sorry, guys, I'm going to say it again. Can't put lipstick on a pig. I'm sorry. That's the best thing I can equate it to because when I teach my agents, do you have a process? Sorry, Mike, but it, I, I got further corroboration about why it's a great analogy. If you think about the three little pigs, I teach my agents when you're creating a process in your, BEC, your BDC and my BDMs, you must have a strong foundation. You have to have a concrete foundation on which you're going to build all your everything, consistent processes, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you build it on a bed of soda crackers, if you build it from wood or if you build it from straw, the big bad wolf's gonna come and blow it all down and it's not gonna stand. So if you do not have a process in house and then you wanna get all these products, you're not ready, you gotta fix your process. So here's what happened today, here's what's happening. And it's in fixed stops and Stephen, you're gonna love this if you're still here, is that- you He, he had a roll. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, 
because he would have loved this, but for fixed stops too, has anybody left in fixed stops? But anyway, we're all fixed stops, right? Kayla, you are. So what's happening is um, the BDC agents that are taking the inbound service and doing the outbound campaigns, there's a lot of churn. So they're not fully onboarded. So when in doubt, they call a service advisor. How do I set an appointment for this? What app code do I use? Blah, blah, blah. Then the service writers aren't answering their phone. Customers are getting irate uh, because, and the newbies don't know what to tell them. So they tell them to call them back, boom. If it's like a tire with low air, they're already at discount tire and you lost the customer. So what I said today is I said, this is what you do. I said, like I say for everything, everything you do in sales BDC, you can equate to vehicle buying centers or fixed stop service BDCs. So I said, this is what we're gonna do effective immediately. BDA, BDA, BDC agent goes to the BDM who's sitting right there in the office with them. They got a question, they mute and they say, hey, so-and-so, they ask the question. He doesn't, and when he's not there, then the director answers it. They don't know, they go to the service drive manager. Service drive manager doesn't know or isn't available, they go to the service manager. Forget this with the advisors because they take their sweet time. And then when they're not wanting to work really hard, they're calling the agents direct and saying, with multiple stores, don't schedule me any more appointments today or any appointments tomorrow. I'm full. So I said, no, you have to have a process. You have to go chain of command. You have to go agent to manager to manager to advisor to tax or whatever it is. Because if the people at the desk in the sales department or the BDC manager in the BDC or the service manager who oversees their advisors, if management doesn't know it's broken, they can't fix it. Right. So when in doubt, set the appointment. What your tires pressure is low. Bring oh, give the empathy. Sorry, Mr. Customer, or if it's a frazzled sounding young mother, let me take care of that for you right away. Let's get you in here. What does your day look like? You set the appointment. You put it in the tell me more if you don't know the silly app code. Let the advisors do that. Bring the customer in. They're number one fulfill the the whole thing keep the customer service experience good and figure out all the rest of it later but you got these dueling banjos here in all the different departments because they're all the little guys are all going to each other and there's no consistency and there's no process implementation or adherence to process whatever and then it all blows up so you got to start at the at the base at the foundation and start with a chain of command and figure out make sure that the decision makers know are aware of the problems also complete notes same as in sales we got to note the thing the processes they're calling from they're not notating in crm or wherever there's no history there's no customer comments so i also told the guy i said start a to spreadsheet and if an agent has to to something to you put it on that on that log on that and then you make sure that you see trends and you know areas of opportunity for coaching and training within your teams to improve the customer experience. So you're off the phone with them in two minutes instead of 10. And then you write it into process and you make it practice. So I don't know. Does that make sense? That's what I got. Sure it does. And, and we're back to the old thing. If you have seven processes, you have no process. <laughs> yep. Well, guys, I was getting kind of tired. You got me all worked up now. That's great. We love it. <laughs> hey, we, we still have to hear from my deferring buddy, Mike Larkin, and one of my favorite guys, Fred Thorne. Uh, Fred, Mike, who'd like to go first? Your inputs are always welcome. Well, I just looked it up. Uh, there's just under 70,000 car dealers in the U.S. Um, and I said it, one of the first shows, um, the 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 perception of society is as follows: politicians are at the bottom, lawyers just just above that, and then car dealers. And uh, Larry, the people that you're training um, out of that seventy thousand are the tip of the spear, the best of the best. Uh, we need to get more Larry's duplicated and run around the country and training these uh, these sales and service. Um, to be honest with you, we're going in the right direction as an industry. Um, 
uh, and but but you're the one percent, Larry. Um, and I'm just not stroking you here. It's it's the truth, um, based on the people I talk to, and I recommend you everywhere I can, and every place I can in New England. Um, so th that's that's the way I see it right now, and with the AI and all that, you know, good stuff coming aboard, that's fine. But it's all about the reputation of the individual rooftop. And they've got to make a decision because a lot of these guys have tens, hundreds, if not thousands of reviews, and they keep on shooting themselves in the foot. You need to market those reviews. Tell the people in your CRM or what have you that, hey, guys, we just got on our five-star review. Take a look. Um, to get that and, and perception Michael, better. And Michael, it shouldn't just be that you're shooting for the review. It should be you're shooting for a satisfied customer and the net result will be a good review. Right, right. But you're not writing the response to the review for the person writing the review. You're writing it for the tens of thousands of people right. locally that are watching that review, but your response to a good review or a bad review. It needs yes, to be sir. professional. Yeah. So, so let me just jump on that for a second there, Mike. Uh, we we had a, a long conversation this weekend about this specific topic. And given the spreadsheet that I, I shared with you um, of, of all 17,088 car dealer OEM franchise car dealerships in the United States, the, we know that where the problem is we know we can address the problem we need to get to those dealers that are the bad apples it's not like we're, we're looking at a a a under 20 percent uh challenge in our industry but that 20 percent challenge is making the voice for the other 80 percent and because their voice is that much louder or their noise is that much louder, it's affecting the rest of the dealership groups. And we have to tamper out that bad voice and that bad noise. And we and that's what we're here for is to to go in and address those needs and help them achieve a better status. Hey Peter, um of of those that you shared with me. Um, I was able to filter out 3,710 like that need what we have. And I'm like, yes. wow. Yes, absolutely. Hey, Fred, what do you have to say, my good and great friend? Not much, guys. I love you all. <laughs> but I was going to ask you, ask Ian, how far he's got to walk? Oh, it's car? not far. That's not okay. I, just, I live a couple blocks away from this restaurant, so I'm just going for okay. a walk. I walk a Ian, couple times a day. Ian's walking okay. around in circles, Fred. He's passed his house five times. But, I, but I, I do have to comment on a furniture purchase. So I bought a couch recently from Ashley Furniture. And right. their process, soup to nuts, is unbelievable. I'm actually probably going to write an article on it because in terms of buying the thing, financing the thing, if you so choose, I didn't, but you could. The reviews, the follow-up, the text messages. I mean, it, it was a, a master class in how to follow up a customer who hasn't even got the furniture yet because they hadn't even delivered it at that point. But even after the sale, there was multiple touch points. And they sell furniture. They sell something very uninteresting compared to a car. But they have a process, and they work it every time. The, and they're a the pretty big operator, right? The, cha cool. the challenge there, Ian, is that companies like that Companies like McDonald's, companies like Chicken Filet, yeah. all these companies spend more money on training for anywhere from a five dollar purchase to a five hundred to five thousand dollar purchase than we yeah. do on a fifty thousand dollar purchase. Well, but they and sell warranty, they do delivery, they, you know, they they they, you know, they'll they'll give you a credit to buy other stuff. I mean, it was it was a master class in what to do. And it could oh, be adapted. Absolutely. It's not that hard. It could be adapted. No, it's not. no question. Yeah. 
just just my thought there. Anyway. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything pertinent? Because uh, we're we've gone about an hour, and boy, what a great conversation! Anybody have you know, anything guys, like can that? I, can I throw something in here? Please, sure. Doug. Please. The, the the two things that keep coming up. One is there's a lack of a culture of accountability in most dealerships. We don't hold, let alone our leaders, but even the rank and file, accountable to any sort of performance and behaviors. And the other thing that's becoming abundantly clear is the total lack of training and coaching to support what we expect. We just kind of throw them to the wolves and hope everything works out. And to me, it, it really, it does come down to from the top down. If you're, I mean, I saw a survey that said 84% of dealers rate customer experience as their number one goal this year. Well, that's great. But just saying it means nothing. But doing it means changing your culture and holding people accountable to the new set of standards. And I just don't see that being done. I agree. Absolutely. I'm with you. Uh, ha having said that, Doug, and, and you, you're absolutely spot on, we, we, don't, we don't hold people accountable anymore. We, we use the term... Uh, inspect what we expect, and and it's it's just flippant words these days. We don't care. It, the the caring has has left the building, and most of these bottom twenty percent, as as Mike so set so defined from the spreadsheet. It's it's and it's that that segment of the marketplace that is. Driving, driving the reputation the of the 80 percent plus all right are we going to wrap up now i lost unless all. anybody else has any pertinent if if not man it was so great to have everybody on Every one of you, April, thanks for jumping on with two hours rest and Kaylee and Wendy and, and Doug. And, and it was so nice to see Steve Apicella. And it's always a pleasure to see my buddy, Ian Nethercott. Everybody, appreciate you all. Thank you, everyone. Have, Have a great night. night. Have a great night. Thank Absolutely. Everyone. It was a great night. See you next week, I hope. Thank you. Have a good one.